love God's Word. I know I've told you that before. I hope I show it every week when I preach. And really, my life's work is to help others read and understand and follow the Bible well. And that's why I quite simply love my job. I feel like the most uh, blessed guy alive every week I get to be up here. And um, most of the time, you get to just see the finished product. But I want to let you, you know, look under the hood this morning. I want to read this passage with you and offer up a few different lenses that I think you can use in your own Bible reading. I use them as I prepare a sermon, as I look through uh, at the passage through these different lenses. And I believe so deeply that what we will share here together will enhance your ability to read the Bible well. I also think we'll give you a, you know, a better ear for good preaching, right? There's lots of good preaching out there. There's lots of not good preaching out there, right? YouTube is great, but the uh, uh, price of admission is just have a video. It's not necessarily truthiness um, that gets you on there. And so what I want to do this morning is allow you to see how to look for Jesus in every story. See, oftentimes when you have a sermon, you'll just see these three lenses. You kind of look through them all at once and they're uh, all, all given to you at one time. But this morning, We're going to look at each lens progressively so that you can see how I look at a passage and how I believe a passage ought to be looked at by you. So here's our three lenses. The first lens is us. The second lens is Israel. And primarily, it's like, you know, that's the contextual lens of where we're looking at the story as we find it in Scripture. And then last is God. So they're not in necessarily order of importance. Hopefully, that is evident since God is last and we're first, right? Um, But what these three lenses do is they give us, what is this passage saying to us? What did this passage say to the people it was given to? And what does this passage tell us about how God is working in redemptive history? So we're going to be in Exodus. We're going to start in chapter 17. So we will read this story we have this morning, starting in chapter 17, verse 8. Please hear God's word. It says, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek. And while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. So they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek with his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it to the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called it the name, the Lord is my banner, saying, a hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Chapter 18. Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home, along with her two sons. The name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And the other was named Eliezer, for he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness, where he was encamped at the mountain of God. And when he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her, Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other about uh, their welfare and went into the tent. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake all the hardship that had come upon them in the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel, and that he had delivered them out of the hands of the Egyptians. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hands of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with his people. 
And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. The next day, Moses sat down to judge the people. The people stood around Moses from morning until evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another. I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, what you're doing is not good. You and the people uh, with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice. I will give you advice, and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God, and you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, Look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And then let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they will decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you, and you will be able to endure, and all the people also will go to their place in peace. So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men out of Israel and made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And when they judged the people of all times, any hard case they brought to Moses, but any small matter they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went away to his own country. This is God's word. So now we have three lenses to look at this expansive text together. It's almost maybe like three mini sermons, but don't get too intimidated. So the first lens is us. Now, this lens is appropriate to look at this passage and see how God wants to teach us about how to live our lives faithfully as we walk in discipleship in Jesus. And in this passage, we get to see Moses living out his faith as a faithful servant of God. Messages that look through this lens, this us lens, are heavy on application, and that's always appropriate. And the end, it may sound something like, so be like Moses in these ways. You've heard sermons like this, where we look at these great figures in Scripture, Abraham, David, or Paul, and we say, be like them. All of them are living lives radically devoted to the things of God, and we can look at principles and ways that they've lived their lives. And it, may, uh, it won't be a surprise that there are some lessons in leadership that we see in this passage. And so this first lens we'll look through us will have three lessons in leadership. The first is that leaders are not loners. See, Moses was an exceptional leader. When you look at what he did, liberating two to three million people, right? It says 600,000, but that was just the men. So you add in the families, two to three million people. That is an incredible leadership feat. But that was just a few days of the leadership of Moses. And he was called to lead. And there was no mistake, no no, uh, um, confusion about it. God called Moses. Remember that scene early on in Exodus 3 at the burning bush? God said, I will send you. But we see very quickly that Moses did not shoulder that burden alone. Even before he gets out of that initial conversation with God, God provides Aaron with him to go alongside Moses and to help him in the work. And so this set the course of the ministry of Moses so that when we get to chapter 17 and they face these enemies, the uh, uh, Amalekites, he has Joshua to call on. That's a name that whole book of the Bible is named after him. It's a name that maybe is familiar with you. Now the Am- uh, Amalekites, I always like stumble over that name a little bit, um, The Amalekites were a semi-nomadic people. They lived in the south of Palestine. And later we find out, this is way back in Genesis 14, I believe, um, that uh, Esau had a grandson named Amalek. And this is where these people come from. These are scary people. These are the people that when they look into Canaan, the promised land, they see the Amalekites and they get scared. And this leads to 38 more years of wandering in the desert because of how formidable these foes were. And they face them very early on in their journey in the wilderness. And Moses calls upon Joshua. Leaders are not loners. Moses had somebody to call on. And Joshua leads the soldiers onto the field, but he has more leaders. 
he calls Aaron and her to go with him to the top of the hill so he could lead from there. And they discovered that this holding up of the hands was so effective that when Moses did it, they won. And when his hands went down, they didn't. But I don't know if you've ever, have you ever like, a, you know, done lateral raises with a weight? Like try to hold that out for that long and your arms get weary really quickly. And so Moses, who is a little along in years at this time, is doing his best to keep his hands up, but they get weary. But he's not a loner. He had two more leaders alongside of him. So rather than those guys steal the staff and take the glory for themselves, they see that he needs help. And so they get a stone, put it on Moses. They lift up Moses' arms. And the victory is won by God's power because no one led alone. Moses was the farthest thing from a loner. And we also see that Moses, as he came up with a judicial system for his people, knew that leadership needed to be placed on different tiers of his people. So that part where his father-in-law comes to him and says, what you're doing isn't good, you've got to figure this out. And so he appoints more leaders over thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens so that they could settle disputes. And so the big stuff came to Moses. The small stuff stayed away from him, and it was settled at more local levels. It's not unlike the system, uh, the judicial system we have today with different tiers of courts. And as the matters get more intense or more confusing, they raise up the scale. And so some stuff would make it to Moses, but he had leaders positioned at different tiers to handle things for him. So leaders are not loners. But that improvement in his system of placing leaders at different tiers all come from one question. He's asked by Jethro, his father-in-law. Jethro says, why do you sit alone? The one time Moses kind of got it a little wrong, he chose the loner route. Maybe he just thought, you know, God chose me. I need to be the guy standing up and settling these disputes. Or maybe it was just sort of a moment of pride. But when Moses was a loner and let alone, that's when things got a little tricky. And so, The vast majority of Moses' ministry was leading not alone. But that question, why do you sit alone, leads us to our second point, is that leaders are learners. So again, Moses was the one called up, and he was the one who would speak to God face to face. It would be so tempting when you have that kind of access to God. You know, again, later in Exodus 33, 11, it said Moses would speak to God as a friend face to face. It would be so easy to assume, well, I guess I'm the guy that has to do anything. And I guess I'm the guy who probably knows everything. But we see also that Moses takes the posture of a learner. And so he has to look at his father-in-law and hear his father-in-law say very plainly, you know, his father-in-law Jethro comes in, you know, good to see you. I got your wife. I got your kids. I'm going to observe you for a day. You know what great father-in-laws do. Like, I'm just going to sit back and watch you do your thing. And make some judgments, right? And you got to love Jethro. He comes up with this hot take on how Moses is operating. He doesn't bear the headline. He says, what you are doing is not good. Now he says that to the man who speaks to God as a friend face to face. The man who God revealed himself as Yahweh in the burning bush. How would Moses respond? Moses responds as a learner. He has some good advice. He looks at the system as what you're doing isn't good. He says, you ought to place place leaders over thousands and uh, hundreds and fifties and tens. And Moses hears that. Again, Moses, the guy who speaks to God face to face, who would be so tempted to think that he knows everything. And he receives this advice. And we know he implements because he says, Moses, listen to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. Leaders are learners. And again, the third point, as we look through this us lens, we see that leaders are not loners. We see that leaders are learners. And lastly, leaders are lifters. And I don't mean, you know, weights, right? We knew he couldn't hold his arms up for very long. He couldn't be that big a lifter, right? Good godly leaders lift up the other leaders around them. And good godly leaders ultimately lift up God. You know, one of the great dangers in leadership, I know this well, is the temptation or the risk of becoming a bottleneck to your organization. You can be a bottleneck by trying to go alone. You can be a bottleneck by being so rigid you're unable to adapt. Or you could be a bottleneck by trying to lift yourself up rather than those around you. Moses had this beautiful system where he was lifting up the leaders around him. 
He gave people like Joshua and Aaron and her real consequential work to do in their people. He said, Joshua, you really have to go assemble an army. You really have to sharpen your swords and you really have to get out there and lead an army into battle. And I will be doing what I can as a leader to lift you up. They sniffed out pretty quickly that Moses, as he went to the hill and lifted up his hands, the thing that only Moses could do, that Moses was empowering those leaders on the field. That's what great leaders do. They lift up those around them. And so Moses knew, hey, if I do this, that's the best way for me to empower Joshua. And he built a system where people saw that that's the key to leadership because as his arms failed, what happened to him? The two leaders on either side of him, Aaron and her, lift up Moses. Leaders are lifters, at least good leaders are. They lift up those around them and ultimately they lift up God because as God brought the victory, it would have been so tempting to just high step into the end zone of victory alone. But in the wake of all the celebrations and high fives and champagne showers that they must have been having after this incredible victory against the uh, Amalekites, what does Moses do? He lifts up God. He takes time to build an altar and offer sacrifices so that God, their banner of victory, would receive the honor. So as we look at this, we see through the us lens, that leaders are not loners. Leaders are learners. Leaders are lifters. You can see it's kind of like a sermon in itself, right? When you look through the us lens, you have this heavy application, and you can see that there are some leadership lessons buried in this text. And this is fine and good, but it's not all there is. It's so obvious, I think, that this text has something to say about leadership, but that's certainly not all it has to say. When you hear a sermon like that, if all you hear from us is just application, just leadership lessons, it's not a complete sermon. We have to push forward more into these different lenses. See, if I stopped here, it would just go be like Moses. But no matter how great a leader Moses was, at the end of the day, he was a sinful, flawed person that needed saving by a good, gracious God. So we need to look at the text, not just through the us lens. We need to look on a bigger, broader, global scale. We need to see what that text was doing for this people. One description of what we need to do in the next moments we have together is by Peter Enns, a biblical scholar. He says this. He says, there is something deeper happening in the Bible than the immediate application of surface teachings to our own private circumstances. The whole point of a specifically Christian interpretation of the Old Testament is to see passages such as this ultimately within the context of God's culminating salvation in Christ. You can see that there's more than just this us level. This goes, this method of interpretation is one you'll see all the time here. We don't say its name and I'll, you'll see very quickly why we don't say its name that often. It goes by this incredible name, redemptive, historical, Christocentric interpretation. This rolls off the tongue, right? You know, take that one home to your campuses. There are formal definitions, but let's just take it a word at a time. Redemptive, that God is saving people. Historical, that he did it in real human history through real events that really happened, namely the cross. And Christocentric, they all center on that climactic event where God set captives free. Not just from bondage and slavery in an earthly sense, but from bondage to sin and death. Preaching isn't really preaching until you've gone here. This redemptive, historical, Christocentric sense in which every text, even Exodus, comes to life as we see what God has done. You'll see this preaching so eloquently done in Tim Keller, somebody we uh, um, talk about a long time here. Sometime uh, I got to have lunch with him, you know, about 12 years ago, like one of the highlights of my life. He is famous for popularizing this way of preaching. And he puts it this way in one of his classes on preaching. He says, every biblical text also has its place in the entire Bible, which has its purpose, the revelation of Christ as the climax of all God's redeeming activity in history. We must not only ask what did the human author intend to say to his historical audience, but also why did God inscripturate this as a way of pointing 
to the salvation of his son. So you can see we need these next two levels, Israel and God. They will come a a little quicker at us. That level of us isn't bad, but it's not all there is. The Bible is not just a great book of morals or interesting, compelling history or a book of great advice that you just turn to when you're stumped on something. The Bible tells the story of God saving a wayward humanity in real time, in real history, through what he did, ultimately leading towards the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We need to end our time here together by asking this question. How does this point towards God's salvation in Christ? And so as we do that, as we move past the us lens, let's look at the Israel lens. What was this text doing for Israel? So God was calling forth a people to himself, the special people that would be distinct and different and would be blessed to be a blessing. And we know that it is connected to a bigger Israel story because way back when in Exodus 2, we read as they cried out to God and they groaned, it says God remembered his covenant with who? Not with Moses yet. God remembered his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. That is a story that started way back in Genesis. And what was that covenant? Quite simply, it was God would bless them so that they would be a blessing. How would God bless them? He'd give them a people and a land. And he would take them on this incredible journey to take that land and become that people so that they would be blessed to be a blessing. And the ultimate blessing that they would have is that they would show the world what God was like. And as they'd go through these things, they would learn. So even in just the book of Exodus, we have seen God reveal himself. When they cross the Red Sea, we see that God has the power of salvation. When they go to Mara with that bitter water, it exposes this testing place where God reveals the human propensity to wine. Then God takes them right after that to Elam. We didn't spend a lot of time on that particular scene, but it's this place of ample supply of water and rest. In the wilderness of sin we dealt with not too long ago, it's a place where God shows himself sufficient to meet their needs of bread and meat, even in the face of their grumbling. When God makes it to Massah and Meribah, these places of quarreling and testing where God continues to show himself able. Rephidim that we just read was a a place where God showed himself able to win a military victory. And all of these things, all of these events are part of a bigger story that God is telling through Israel to redeem a people, to bless them so that they would be a blessing. And how is it happening? Is God making good on this promise to bless the nations? Well, we can see that in this story. Jethro, his father-in-law, was a priest of Midian. It was a different religion in a different place. Have you ever had family that has slightly different religious views than you? If you have, you have something in common with Moses and his father-in-law, Jethro. And all they do is Moses gives this this man, his father-in-law, respect and honor, and they catch up on the story that God has been telling through their people. And Moses doesn't sugarcoat it. He talks about all this great redemption and salvation that God has brought them and all of the hard times that they have had to endure. He just shares the story about what God has been doing through him and through his people. And how does Jethro respond? Verse 9 says that Jethro rejoiced for all the good that Yahweh has done. Verse 10 says that Jethro blesses the Lord. Verse 11 says that Jethro now knows that Yahweh is greater than all the gods. And verse 12 says that Jethro brought burnt offerings and sacrifices to God and then shared a fellowship meal with Moses, Aaron, and all the other elders. Friends, Jethro, a person from a different place, worshiping a different God, is converted. The story of God is happening. He is blessing Israel so that they would be a blessing. And part of that blessing would be to share the good news of a God of grace and mercy and redemption. What this story does for Israel is show them that what God has promised is happening. Yes, they have these very clear signs of crossing the Red Sea, but they also have these smaller signs of this family member who I love now knows Yahweh as God. But there's one more lens. Because see, God is telling that local story in Israel, but he is telling a much broader story. So this last lens we will look through is God. This is where we get to look for Christ as the story and all the stories of the Bible. See, this is the part 
of the story that we often end with, the part of the sermon, I mean, that we often end with, the one that has the most punch, the one that is maybe memorable, because you get to see Christ show up in passages that you didn't know he was in. Christ is the final word of God, even in this story. See, God raised up a great leader in Moses, and he was wise, and he shows us a lot about leadership. But we know that at the end of the day, Moses could not live up to all of the standards of God. God even raised him up to be the adjudicator of some of these tough cases, and he would know the law of God, and he would teach it to the people. But even he, as he settled these debates, his final word, these pronouncements would kind of expire because then the next week or the next day even, those same people would come back and have similar disputes and they would get cross with one another and Moses would have to adjudicate and judge again. And then guess what happened the next day? People would get cross and where they'd steal each other's goats or garments or whatever and they'd come back to Moses and he would have to adjudicate again. And even Moses himself, this titan of the faith, shows us that he can't be that ultimate mediator, that ultimate judge. Because did you know this about Moses, to spoil a little bit maybe from the ending? Moses, because of his sin, never enters the promised land. A whole generation of people never enter the promised land. Because if you end a sermon with be like Moses, you will fall short. You have to look for Christ in the middle of it. Moses was an incredible intercessor. An incredible mediator, but he wasn't. See, as we look at Moses through his weakness and frailty, and we know how he fell short, it gives glory to Jesus. See, Jesus is our true mediator. Listen to this in the book of Hebrews. It says, because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood, therefore he is able to completely, uh, to completely save all those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede with them. Moses' life would come to an end. His intercession between the people and God would stop. But Jesus lives to intercede forever. Listen to this in Hebrews 9. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. What's that first covenant? Moses, in a few chapters, will ascend that mountain of God that mountain of Horeb, that Mount Sinai, and receive the Ten Commandments. Clear as day how God's people should live up to his standards. And what do they do? They fall short. And so God in Christ provides a second covenant. I will obey the law perfectly for you. And if you place your faith in me, you will be saved. Friends, Jesus is the story and every story. It's everywhere. It's all throughout the Old Testament. This is just from what we've covered in Exodus so far. In Exodus 17, Israel needed water and God provided water, but they had to drink that water again and again and again. But in John 9, Jesus says, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, will have rivers of living water flow from within them. Jesus is the real living water. In Exodus 16, Israel's hungry and they wanted bread and God gives them manna, but that manna was good for the day. Jesus Years later, and John 6 would say, Very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus is the true bread of life. Jesus, Je- the, God led Israel through the wilderness, and he had to provide this theophany, a pillar of smoke and fire. And Jesus, and John 14, would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. In Exodus 12, they had to be saved from that final plague through the Passover lamb. And years later, when John the Baptist would see Jesus for the first time, he would say, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the true Passover lamb. Moses would set a people free from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. Jesus would set a people free from bondage of slavery to sin. Friends, the battle has been won. And the battles you face each and every day must be fought in light of that ultimate victory. Church, Jesus is the story in all the stories of the Bible. When you read your scripture, when you hear a sermon, never stop until you get 
to Jesus. That's what makes good Bible reading. That's what makes a good sermon. Jesus is the story and every story. 